Hi there, and welcome to Social Capital Matters. I'm your host, Kylie Taylor. On this show, we take a deep dive into the ideas around social capital by talking to business and industry leaders about how they use it to collaborate with stakeholders and build a framework for long-term success. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode two of Social Capital Matters. We've got a great show for you today because we'll be talking to one of the most accomplished journalists in the business about greenwashing, an issue that sounds almost friendly but can have serious repercussions. I'm joined by by my producer, Greg, in Bangkok. Greg, are you there? Hey, Kylie, I'm doing fine. Nice to see you again. Really excited about today's show. We've got a really cool international lineup. Our guest is in the UK. I'm in Bangkok. You are in Melbourne. It's so cool that we can do these kinds of things without having to fly halfway around the world to see each other. And Greg, thanks for getting up early to make this work today. I I love how technology allows us to do this. No, No problem. I've had my coffee. Our guest today is someone I've known for a long time. Sharon Jitlal is one of the region's leading veteran business broadcasters. She was with the BBC for 18 years, has interviewed many of the world's top business and political leaders, and is constantly popping up around the world at key conferences and panels as a moderator and facilitator. I'm very fortunate that Sharon Jett's got some time to spend with me today. We're going to be talking about greenwashing. Greenwashing is when organizations and brands exaggerate their environmental claims and their environmental performance. It's a really serious issue with serious repercussions. And today I'm going to get a view from the media, a view from the journalist side about how they look at these issues today and how they navigate greenwashing. Hi, Sharon Nice to see you again. Hi, Kylie. It's uh, great to see you too. Yeah. I I thought it'd be really good today to talk about um, greenwashing because it, it's, a, it's a topic that is coming up a lot in the media today. And I'm really interested to get your views on it. Um, you've been around the journalism traps for a long time. What's different now to what it was like five years ago, 10 years ago, or even 20 years ago? Yeah, Kylie, I cannot stress how much this industry has transformed. I mean, journalism now has so many different aspects to it. It's got different platforms, Mm -hmm. you know, some of which didn't even exist when I first started in the industry a quarter of a century ago. That's 25 years. I mean, you've got things like news apps, uh, online sites, social media, podcasts, like the one we're doing right now. There's lots of other digital platforms like TikTok, which is now also putting out journalistic content. Um, and really, if you're a good journalist, you you should be able to contribute to all of these different platforms. And, you know, at the BBC, we were very much encouraged to do that. So, you know, even though I presented the news on TV, I also reported on radio. I also wrote for online. I produced digital videos uh, for the the news app. So you were expected to be multifaceted. Um, I mean, people really need to stay informed, we know, but they also need to to have very accurate, impartial information. Uh, But we we know that there's lots of fake news out there. There's all kinds of one-sided discourse that now sort of dominates uh, social media. So we need to sort of be careful around those things. There's also the speed of news, you know, the mm-hmm. cycle is much faster. You've got n- rolling news coverage, uh, 24 hour news channels. It's a big beast that needs to be fed. So if you're an international broadcaster, the stories are going to be coming from all corners of the globe. Uh, and of course we know news editors are, have a, a big job. They're going to have to decide what gets on and is interesting enough to make the news. And then there are these influencers, you know, people who have a huge following on social media. And that's really meant that journalists now aren't the only ones being invited to press conferences. People who weren't trained in the industry are now also putting out journalistic content. And that's really blurred a lot of lines between what's accurate and impartial. And then to top it off, you've got this thing called paid news, Uh, So, for instance, BBC Studios is the commercial arm of the BBC. It puts out a story that is very different from when BBC News does it. 
you know, there was quite a big controversy when BBC Studios did uh, some paid yeah. coverage for the Chinese telecoms giant Huawei. This was a couple of years ago. The coverage was very different to the kind of coverage we were doing at the time for news. And we know that Huawei is a company that's been sanctioned by many foreign governments for alleged links to the Chinese government. So really, yeah. it's very confusing for viewers to tell things apart these days because, you know, most folks would th- just assume, you know, BBC's impartial content is there. You know, the bar is so high. It's held up so high for news. You need to be impartial to tell the story, uh, both sides of the story. But when it's paid content, really, it's meant to cater to the client who's uh, hired you to do a job. Yeah, yeah. Um, You talked about um, knowing the facts and remaining impartial. Um, I've certainly seen it get harder and harder for media to actually get to the facts and cut through potential greenwashing and virtue signalling. How has that changed the role of a journalist and how do you deal with that? Well, I, I've only got really one word for it, and that's research, research, research. And I cannot stress how important that is, uh, though, of course, the amount of time journalists have to deliver deadlines, that's a lot easier said than done. You know, find out everything there is to know about a company. This includes uh, reading coverage down about it by credible sources. This could be your own work, other people's work from credible news journalists, from organizations you know to be good. These are news organizations that verify their reporting. Uh, then, of course, you know, talk to the analysts. People often forget there are analysts who cover companies as part of their daily jobs. They are looking into how the companies present themselves to shareholders. They will have been at the AGM or sat in or listened into the AGM where questions about ESG uh, are now such an important component of how a company projects itself. It now really makes up an entire chapter in the annual reports of most listed companies around the world. And if they haven't got an entire chapter devoted to ESG, then it's about time they do. So you are seeing companies report differently today when you talk about a whole chapter dedicated to ESG. Do you think companies are getting better at it? Are they getting more transparent? Yeah, I mean, they really have to. You know, they they are being pushed to become more transparent. You've got things like the COP meetings, the most recent of which took place in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt. That really is ensuring that this is the case. Uh, apparently more than 12,000 businesses have now set net zero climate targets. And the number is, of course, growing exponentially. Uh, But there are concerns that these targets have loopholes that are so wide, you can actually drive a diesel truck right through them. And that's precisely the concern that's led the UN Secretary General to set up a task group to recommend the kind of criteria that companies would need to meet uh, uh, the, you know, these to become more credible. Uh, This task group has recommended 10 standards and criteria. These really build on existing standards, such as things like the UN's Race to Zero, uh, the the Science-Based Targets Initiative. Uh, Of course, many companies have set their net zero targets based on these guidelines. And these recommendations include targets that that should lead to an overall reduction in all emissions, but they also really stipulate what corporates should not do, including claiming to be net zero while continuing to expand fossil fuel supply or deforestation. So while I think the term greenwashing covers most incidents of companies trying to get away with it, there's also terms like green wishing and green hushing, would you believe, which uh, according to some analysts is becoming a much more worrying trend. I mean, green wishing uh, essentially are organizations who say they want to achieve net zero. They allude to progress when there isn't any. Then there's green hushing, where companies aren't providing the transparency to what they're doing when it comes to ESG. They're acting quietly behind the scenes with very little visibility of what they're actually doing uh, because they know that if they became uh, more transparent, they would be subject to all kinds of criticism. I mean, it, it is true, isn't it, that You know, of course, lots of companies will push these particular aspects of their businesses. Um, They're really trying to become better. But ultimately, you know, we've we've got such, um, you know, a lens to what they're doing right now. You've got things like COP27. You've got Greta Thunberg, you know, a really vocal teenager Mm. becoming much more vocal. Uh, And so companies are terrified. They're terrified of being subject to this kind of scrutiny. And they really are going to have to get with the picture and get better. 
I love that uh, green wishing um, and green hushing. And I think you can apply that across other aspects of ESG as well. And as you were saying that, I was thinking of, you know, purpose washing and purpose wishing and purpose hushing or social wishing and social hushing. I think I'm going to use these terms. I'm going to borrow them from you and and use them. Uh, The the other issue that we've we've come across a lot is that um, organizations have one part of their business where they're really focused on achieving certain ESG commitments and they really push that and they want to talk about that story. But when you get into the business or their whole group of companies, if they're um, a, a larger conglomerate, that's just one part of their business. But while they're doing some good things over here, over here, they're not applying the same standards and the same principles. Do you come across that? And how do you dig into that and, and deal with that to get the whole picture? Well, I mean, it's tough, isn't it? Because how do you catch companies in a lie? How do you do that, really? And again, I think it's going back to what I said earlier. It's about research, research, research. Find out everything there is to know about that company. Talk to everyone who's uh, covered that company uh, somehow, if they're an analyst who cover it in their daily jobs. Just find out, you know, talk to the regular real people, perception customers about how these companies you know, you sort of manage to, you know, portray themselves uh, because the way they portray themselves is very different from how they actually act. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough thing to do. I don't think journalists have sort of superpowers to be able to tell things apart, but I think just to become as, as, and as, as informed as you can be on, on a particular subject, that's really important. I think the big message is clearly um, research, doing the research really, really well. So we often see um, companies making mistakes and making claims and getting found out, often because of the work that great journalists and the media are doing to create greater transparency. But then the companies are on the back foot Um, having been found out for greenwashing or or lying, and then they're going into full-blown crisis management. The two examples that I I can think of, um, and I know, uh, Sharon, you've worked on many over the years, but the the VW case, the the diesel gate, where that's an absolute case of um, lying and fraud, or or a different kind of case is the Rio Tinto, uh, Duke and Gorge, that when Rio Tinto blew up those Indigenous sites. That was more to do with complete negligence and and hubris. But in both those cases, both those organisations had major reputation issues and had to do a lot of repair work. Um, From your experience of working with organisations and and reporting on these crises, what do you think organisations should be doing when they get it wrong? Well, really, the best thing to do, Kylie, is is to uh, come clean, uh, admit the mistakes, and then take the relevant action to try to rectify those mistakes. But then again, you know, you may have made such a huge mistake that you can never fully recover. And of course, that good example that you mentioned is Volkswagen. Uh, of course, it's huge crisis emissions scandal, diesel gate, or whatever you call it. It came to light in 2015. Uh, essentially, they use software to cheat uh, emissions, uh, very rigorous emissions tests, and they were found out. And really, it cost them tens of billions of dollars in fines. There was a massive recall of vehicles. Uh, there were class action suits, of course, many of which are still uh, happening today. Their CEOs, senior executives uh, were forced to resign. One was actually even arrested for being part of the conspiracy. And of course, its brand reputation was hit and it never really fully recovered. Of course, what they have done to to try to rectify the situation is Volkswagen has pledged that half of their car production uh, will be electric by 2050. And just this year alone, they pledge uh, to manufacture some 800,000 electric vehicles by the end of the year. Uh, So obviously, it's something they've had to try to do to repair the damage. But I think the damage still exists. And it's going to take them a long time to to overcome it. And of course, something you may know a lot more about in Australia, Kylie, is, is the Rio Tinto scandal, which you mentioned as well. They've had to apologize 
for the Duke and Gorge. This is an ancient, sacred Aboriginal site they destroyed. And in spite of the fact that red flags were already raised ahead of the demolition going ahead. Now, the new CEO has said uh, himself that a lot more work needs to be done to win back trust. But, you know, just how do these huge multinational firms do that? They may never be able to fully salvage their reputations. It's going to take a really long time for people to forgive then there's the German asset manager, DWS. Uh, that's a scandal which erupted that's after. A good example. That's right. And, and that's something that's really been uh, in the news a lot. You know, it's former chief sustainability officer, Desiree Fixler. She blew the whistle on the company's misrepresentation of its green credentials. This sparked investigations into the company from both sides of the Atlantic. It created essentially an environment where regulation of companies and what they claim they are doing in terms of their green credentials need to be scrutinized. It's something we know Australia too has announced just this week, that, you know, companies that overstate their ESG and sustainability initiatives are going to be subject to penalties and punitive measures. So now regulators are going to make it much harder for companies to get away with uh, such things in the future. And really, they, they need to keep that scrutiny up uh, about what companies are doing. You're right. In all those cases we've just talked about, um, there were major changes at the board level and major changes in senior management as a result. But that alone won't be enough to repair the damage. I know plenty of people who will now never buy a VW. So it doesn't matter how that they go fully electric, the trust that's gone in that brand and in that organisation is just gone and it will be very hard for them yeah. to get it back. And bear in mind, VW also encompasses things like BMW, Audi and all these other major brands. So, you know, it, it is such a huge company that, uh, you know, just inflicted this incredible conspiracy on the rest of the world. And, and just how extraordinary is that, that they were allowed to get away with it for so many years and then were caught. But I guess that, that the fact that they were caught is a lesson in itself. Yes, yes. And as you said, the, the regulatory environment is changing across every sector and we're seeing a lot of movements in the financial regulation right across the world. So I think this issue is going to be in the newspapers, in the headlines for some time to come. So given that, um, what advice would you give to organisations today so that they actually get out there and tell their story but do it without avoiding being a green washer or, or a green wisher or or all those those other terms that we talked about? How can yeah. how can companies do the right thing and be genuine? Have you got any tips? Yeah, I mean, that's a tough one. I think a lot of companies are already starting to do this now because they realize they simply have to. They've got no choice. They must do this because there's so much scrutiny on what they're doing. And, you know, it's nice to know that, you know, there have been things like the Business Roundtable. This was a, a group of a huge American companies, you know, J.P. Morgan, uh, Ford and, and a number of others who came together and they put out a statement, uh, I think fairly recently, this was only about two or three years ago, uh, that what a company should do shouldn't just be for shareholders, it should be for all stakeholders. And these stakeholders include, um, you know, people who are concerned about the environment and, and everything else, because, of course, ESG also encompasses social and governance as well. So you need to have the diversity element. You need to have so many things that you're looking at as a company these days. You can't just go out and make money. You have to give back to the world in some way. Uh, otherwise, you know, your customers simply won't trust you. So I think the best thing companies can do is absolutely, yes, first of all, at the very least, abide by the regulatory uh, requirements, you know, that the fact they, they do need to give credible, truthful ESG reporting. Um, many of, the, of them have made it a part and parcel of their annual reports every year. There's a whole chapter that's devoted to ESG now, and they need to take that very seriously. I mean, basically, companies need to walk the talk if they are going to be taken seriously enough. They are really going to have to be genuinely interested in wanting to take this, uh, this path that will make them, you know, ultimately a better company, 
um, you know, in the long run, the bottom line will be much better as well because you're going to have customers that trust you, that want to use your products or want to use your services because they feel that you represent something that's good out there. You're not just going out to exploit people or exploit the environment. And, you know, customers are becoming so much more um, you know, rigorous about their standards. And uh, they simply aren't going to just take what they did before. The world is changing. You know, we've got seven years now to hit those emissions targets. The likelihood is, I mean, the real tragic likelihood is at the way we're going right now, we're not going to hit them. Mm. But, you know, things like the COP meetings ensure that this is something that people are paying attention to. They're, you know, taking it seriously and companies, um, financial institutions, they're going to have to come in line. I like when you said um, walk the talk, and we often talk about the um, the gap between what you say and what you do, the say-do gap. And I think um, this is becoming part of conversations we're having all the time with corporate leaders, and they don't want there to be a gap. They want to be living up to and doing what they say they do. And I think if that's the focus of corporate leaders, then they're definitely on the right path. And I'm not going to forget your very important message today too is research, research, research. And look, I think that's relevant to journalists, of course, covering a story. Um, but, you know, in, in what I'm doing every day and what my team are doing as corporate affairs advisors, we need to be doing the same level of research and scrutiny to make sure that we're actually working with the companies we're working with to tell accurate stories and not misrepresent or mislead. And so that's a really great message. As Thank usual, you. it's great catching up with you. Normally we have a cup of tea when we catch up, but it's been lovely to catch up with you this way today. Um, Sharon, thank you so much for your time. Now tell me if people are interested to find out more about what you're doing now, where can they find that out? Sure, they can go visit my website. That's uh, www.sharonjeetlail. I know that's a difficult name. I will spell it for you. Uh, that's www.sharonjitlail.com um, and uh, that's S-H-A-R-A-N-J-I-T-L-E-Y-L. Um, no uh, periods in between, just straight on sharonjitlail.com. So go and visit. Uh, I can definitely help a lot of companies out there who need advice. I can media train <laughs> chief executives to help them come across, uh, you know, truthfully and i'd like to think they are telling the truth these these days i think it's an absolute requirement and uh yeah no it's been great talking to you as well kylie lovely lovely to see you right let's catch up again soon thanks sharon Jett. thank you kylie greg that was a really great discussion with sharon Jett, wasn't it yeah, fantastic. You can really tell she's a super professional. She really knows her stuff and she comes well prepared for every interview, which mirrors what she said about doing your research. You know, I was really, really interested about what she said about how, you know, untrained citizen journalists now on social media have this incredible reach and exposure that they never used to have. You know, I think back to my days in film school when I had hundreds of thousands of dollars of professional equipment, which is now on my phone. And it's incredible what we can do, but I do wonder if the genie is out of the bottle now and whether uh, this new relationship is going to dismantle or demolish the old power structures and how that'll play out. I don't know the answer. I've got a feeling the genie's definitely out of the bottle and there's no going back. I mean, I look at my teenage children and they are used to creating and sharing content as a way that they communicate and a, and a way that yeah. they live. But I think we will find a new equilibrium and we've already seen it, especially around big global um, um, uh, political issues and elections and so forth. People will turn back to qualified, well-known media sources on the mm. big issues that really matter. You're not going to look at a teenager's TikTok to <laughs> understand um, who to vote for. Well, some people will, but overall, I think there'll be a rebalancing. Yeah, it's interesting. We'll have to see how that plays out. 
Yeah, well, please don't listen to my children's TikTok to understand <laughs> who to vote for. Uh, look, the other thing that um, Sharon Jett really um, zoomed in on was the um, the role of organisations to benefit all their stakeholders. And, you know, a little golden rule that um, we're trying to, to work by with our clients is um, if you take a stakeholder lens to every decision and look at every decision and say, how does this benefit this stakeholder group and this stakeholder group and that yeah. stakeholder group. And if that's how you're making decisions, then you've got to be on the right foot. And when you know that a decision is not going to benefit a stakeholder group, how you're managing that with that mm. stakeholder group has got to set you on the right path. So I think that um, the, the two things I've taken from Sharon Jett's discussion is research, 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 and you can never do enough research and take a stakeholder lens to your decision making. Yeah, great advice that anyone can use. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you back here next time. And I'm sure we're going to have another great interview on the topic of social capital. Thanks so much. Social Capital Matters has been a production of Baldwin Boyle Group, hosted by Kylie Taylor and produced and edited by Greg Jorgensen. Find more episodes in our ongoing series on baldwinboyle.com slash podcasts, watch on YouTube, or listen wherever you find your podcasts. Mm-hmm.